and very high usage, more than 200 doses per month, is a risk factor for asthma-related death. Also, these medications, now, they, they spoke about the use of beta blockers because we know from the old teaching that beta blockers should not be used in asthmatics. Now, they are a bit flexible, and this is, again, uh, belongs to the uh, medical side, not to the pediatrics. Asthma uh, with COPD overlap syndrome, and this also belongs to the medical side. On conclusion, if you go on with the idea that asthma is a chronic disease that carries significant morbidity and morbid mortality, I would be happy if you understand and take home the idea that controlling asthma will improve our health services, will decrease our admissions to the hospital, will decrease the cost and the expenditure on the medical services, this would be great. Thank you very much for your attendance and patience. Thank you, Dr. Anufud, for your uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, to conclude, usually, I mean, we are pediatricians, we love to eat sweets. So we'd like to conclude with our uh, colleague, Dr. Abdullah Faris. Dr. Abdullah Faris, uh, when I was reading his uh, CV, I found out that he did his training back in Vancouver in BBC, which is beautiful British Columbia. Dr. Abdullah Al Faris, coming from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, he is the head of the Department of Pediatric Endocrinology. He did his uh, fellowship in diabetes. Dr. Abdullah. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Jum'an barak alaykum jami'an. First, I would like to thank all. La, I'm going to go. First, I would like to thank all the organizing committee for inviting me for this uh, outstanding conference. So my talk today will be about the insulin resistance in childhood. So this is a very huge topic, but I try my best to make it as simple as I can and as short as I can. My talk today will be about the beginning with the insulin uh, secretion, insulin action, its receptor and uh, uh, transporter. And then I will move to the insulin resistance in obese children and then the insulin resistant in uh, with patient who's thin. And then I will move to the metabolic syndrome and then the prevention. First, only 2%, so I need your kind concentration, please. So 2% of the pancreas weight is beta cell. Those cells, they produce the insulin on the rate of one unit per each kilogram. And there is other hormone secreted from the pancreas. Insulin, insulin uh, structure, as we know, alpha and beta, they are bound, bound with the uh, uh, disulfide bound. I like this island, subhanAllah, with this uh, bridge. Okay. Anyway, insulin degradation, liver 60%, kidney 40%. The half-life of the insulin is around three to five minutes when it was it started to be in the blood. And then it will be stimulated by glucose, amino acid, free fatty acid, GIT hormones. And early phase is ready insulin already there and the late phase synthesis de novo depend on the glucose stimulus. So insulin secretion is continuous. It is 24 hour working and it is stimulated for the carbohydrate as biphasic, the first phase, as we mentioned, it is the ready one, which is takes just three to five minutes. And then the second phase, which is almost near to one hour. So what will happen when we eat carbohydrate? So when we eat carbohydrate, what will happen? It will be uh, digested to a simple glucose. And then this glucose will be entered into the bloodstream and then will go to the pancreas, and then it will stimulate the pancreas to be secreted, and then the insu insulin, it takes, the, which is the key, it, it takes this glucose and at the end enter into the cell. Okay. There is no insulin is produced when the plasma glucose below 50 milligrams. Three short glucose stimulated secretion is 100 milligram per deciliter with the balance of alpha with the I mean glucagon from the alpha cell. 
of the pancreas. The half maximum insulin response occur at 150 milligram. The maximum insulin response to glucose is at the rate, uh, I mean, at the concentration of 300. After that, the insulin will be as a plateau. So we remind ourselves for the secretion of insulin. So as we mentioned, when they digest the food, the, this glucose will go to the blood and then will enter directly without any help to enter through the transport in number two to the cells. This is the beta cell. This is the beta cell. Then it will be uh, uh, glycolysis, ATP to ADP ratio. At the end, there will be a closure of the potassium channel and then the dubularization of the cell membrane of the beta cell. And then what will happen, the calcium will be influx inside the cells and this the insulin, which is the ready-made insulin and then secrete it to the blood. And this one, this insulin will take the glucose to the other tissue. There is other stimulus more than glucose, yes. There is amino acid, acetylcholine, free fatty acid, and other unsulfonylurea can stimulate the insulin, but with different mechanism. Okay, what a factor affecting insulin secretions can be chemical, hormone, and neuron. I'll be fast a little bit. Stimulatory agent for the condition is hyperglycemia, amino acid, fatty acid, GIT hormones, acetylcholine, and sulfonylurea. Inhibitory agent of insulin secretion, somatostatin, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. The alpha, alpha adrenergic is inhibitory for the insulin secretion, but the beta is stimulatory. Transporter of glucose, I mean of uh, uh, insulin. One and three, all over the body, all over the tissue, and especially the neuron. This is a glucose basal transport directly without the help, and they don't need the insulin. So these transporter, they have high affinity to glucose and enter it directly to the brain and the other important tissue. GLUT2, which is in the liver and beta cells, depend on the concentration. So if the glucose is high, will be entered to the, the affinity or will be increased by uh, GLUT2 and then will lead to more secretion of insulin. And if the glucose is low, there is will be no glucose, I mean, there is no insulin, so it depends on the affinity. Transporter four, the skeletal muscle, cardiac, and the debose tissue. These, the transporter need as insulin dependent. Many individuals with insulin resistant, they are having a deficient in glucose transporter four. Okay. This is the insulin, when it's bind to its alpha subunit, it will stimulate the beta alpha subunit and then tyrosine kinase, and then autophosphorylation of the other cascade, which lead to the, at the end to the action of the uh, mediated uh, insulin uh, effect on glucose, fat, and protein. Okay, so this is the final physiology, and then we'll go to the other. This is the glucose here in the blood with the insulin, which is bind to the alpha subunit of the insulin receptor, the, blue, the yellow one, and then which activate the blue one, which is the beta subunit, and then this activate the tyrosine kinase, and this lead to autophosphorylation of the uh, insulin receptor substance one and other cascade, and this will lead to more phosphorylation, and this will move that transporter, the GLUT4, from intracellular to the cell membrane to open the gate and the glucose will enter inside the cell and lead to the action of insulin to the adipose tissue, muscle, and skeletal. I'll be back to, I'm oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. So what I mean from, from this uh, paragraph, what will happen in insulin-resistant patient, 
Okay, this insulin will not bind to its receptor. There will be defect in the receptor. Okay, so that will be the, the insulin is not binding. So it will be hyperinsulinemia. Plus also the glucose, what will happen here? There will be defect in the cascade and also the defect in the transporter. So what will happen? It will not go to the cell uh, membrane and the, go the gate is not open. So it will be also hyperglycemia. So hyperinsulinemia and hyperglycemia in a patient with insulin resistant. The action, because of the time, it's rapid action. In rabbit, there will be an insulin action in the glucose, amino acid, in the skeleton and the deposit tissue and cardiac. The intermediate, what will happen? Inhibition also of gluconeogenesis. But in the patient with insulin resistant, what will happen? There will be a defect in this action. So it will be stimulation. So, so what will happen? There will be a stimulation of the gluconeogenesis. So increase more in patient with insulin resistance, there will be more uh, uh, secretion of glucose from the liver. The delay action for the other organs, and especially the lipid. So also the defect in insulin resistance, so there will have been more secretion of the triglyceride. Okay, insulin resistant, defined as the ability of, in, of the cells, of, uh, in, uh, uh, of the ability of the cell to respond to the action of insulin transporting the glucose from the bloodstream into the muscle and other tissue. The cell became less responsive to insulin. This lead, as we mentioned, and this lead to hyperinsulinemia and defect in the cells. And this lead to decrease in the glucose uptake will be more hyperglycemia. Whose people in the risk? They are aging with the decrease in their transporter four in with age. Family history, stress as a counter regulatory hormones, like our children also with the iPad and everything, more uh, stress and uh, more uh, also cortisol, and the cortisol increases appetite, so will they will eat more, leading to uh, more obesity. Cholesterolemia, hypertension, and other, and inactivity with hyper, uh, uh, hypertension and, uh, hyper and obesity, and the vindication with the steroid, and the pregnancy with the uh, placental lactogen. Causes of insulin resistant. This is what we'll talk about now. This this is the patient with insulin resistant without obesity, and this with obesity and this the metabolic syndrome. So obesity, the most common cause of insulin resistant, is associated mainly with the post receptor abnormality, and is also associated with decreased number of insulin receptors. So the insulin is not bind to its receptor. المشكلة كلها في الكرش. فمور abdominal obesity is the more than peripheral obesity because of the more cytokines will be secreted and more triglyceride will be secreted. Okay. Anyway, more fat will lead to more insulin muscle and liver resistant more hyperglycemia. So what will happen? This is normally, as we mentioned before, this is the rate, the first phase of insulin secretion, and this is the second phase of insulin secretion. Okay. Patient with hyper, uh, I mean, uh, patient with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetic with insulin resistant, what will happen, see the first phase is lost. Loss of the first phase result in elevation of postprandial glucose. يعني أول حاجة يطلع الجلوكوز postprandial. This is the first sign of pre-diabetic. The delay second phase can result in post meal hypoglycemia. Hadi. Late hypoglycemia. That's why the obese patients usually eat more and they feel hungry all the time. Clinical spectrum. I will be more fast. Sorry for that. Now, we will talk about obesity with insulin resistance. So, this is, can happen with the clinical manifestation of insulin resistant, acanthosis nigricans, and the other. And here is the pseudo acromegaly, and we'll talk about, about it now. So many complications, oh yeah, many, many, many complications. And be here, I will concentrate just only in on this one. Okay, 
female, obese female, they are entering in the puberty early because of the increase in the free testosterone. So we need more, more bone increase in the advanced bone age and then what will happen uh, to uh, uh, be, be became more having more uh, puberty early. In the boys with the, uh, at the bone tissue more, what will happen that with this uh, testosterone will be aromatized to estradiol, and this estradiol will be inhibiting the gonadotropin secretion, so more hypogonadotropin. Simply, obesity lead to early puberty in female, delay puberty in boys. So, patient with insulin, resistant hyperinsulinemia, I, uh, affecting also the IGF-1 receptor, and this will lead to pseudoacromegaly, and acanthosis necrosis and polycystic ovary. So any patient with pseudoacromegaly with insulin resistant with normal IGF-1 and normal growth hormone, this is due to the insulin resistant. And this will lead at the end to the acne, uh, polycystic uh, ovary and male better baldness and more free androgen and irregular, irregular period and infertility. Now we'll move to the genetic causes or insulin resistant without obesity, without obesity. This uh, syndrome, lebrechtianism, with, condi with congenital since birth, they have this morphic feature, acanthosis, negricans, large genitalia, fasting, hypoglycemia, and postprandial hyperglycemia. Rapsum Mendelhal syndrome, with also congenital since birth, with hypertrichosis, insulin resistant, and mentally retarded patients. Lib lipodystrophy, with muscles, can be congenital or at adolescent, subcutaneous fat, either fat partial or total, with acanthosis negricans. So anyone with acanthosis negricans without obesity, think about these syndromes. This one is at, at adolescent with insulin resistant and acanthosis negricans and hypertrichosis. This is a, a table, summarize it. Metabolic syndrome in children. The IDF one, they mentioned that the children for between 10 and 19 years of age can be used the, uh, for them, the same for uh, uh, adults. Criteria, other an institute, WHO and other, IDF one and ATB three. For criteria, any patient with, high, with metabolic syndrome, he must be obese, high triglyceride, low HDL, high blood pressure, systolic or diastolic, and imperial cause tolerance. For IDF1, they mention require, they require the central obesity and two of other abnormality. HDO, HWO, they may, must be al albumin and creatinine ratio must be high, more than 30. IDF1 for the obesity, for the first problem for metabolic syndrome. If the waist is above 94 in male, 80 in female, WHO more than uh, waist to hip ratio more than 0.9 to 0.8 in female, and waist in, in ATB more than 102 and more than 89 in, in female. Obesity criteria, as you know, more than 30, and or the above percentile, the weight, above the 95th percentile. <coughs> Glucose abnormality, I, I, IDF1, they mention above 100, WHO, either in bare glucose or in fasting, ATB more than 110, ADA more than 100. This lipidemia, 150 triglyceride, less than, one four, less than 40, the HDL and the other also. Hypertension, if the blood pressure more than 130 above 80 in IDF1, 140 above 90 WHO, 130 above 80 ATB3. Any patient with obesity, what will we do? Triglyceride. Triglyceride to cholesterol, fasting insulin. CRB will be high with patient with insulin resistant and also the uric acid plus the uric uh, the plus the fasting other insulin uh, other uh, um, uh, lab. Adiponectin will be uh, uh, low and leptin will be high. Therapy treatment for obesity, glucose intolerance, insulin resistant, lipid, and hypertension. Our goal is to minimize the risk of type 2 and cardiovascular disease. So, what will happen this slide? This is what we will do. 
for the lifestyle modification, is it important? It is very important. For abdominal obesity, you must reduce in the first wee year of life, I'll make it because of the time, re walking at least 30 minutes daily, plus decrease your weight at least 10% in the first year, and then up to the weight will be b uh, body mass index below 25. For diabetes, okay, our goal is fasting to be pre-diabetic 110, post 150 and below, hemoglobin A1C7, prothrombotic start aspirin because of the high CRB, very important. And for the control of blood pressure, your goal is 130 over 80. Lipid is very important to start a statin and fibrate. Your goal is LDL below 100 and triglyceride below 150, HDL above 40. Medication, I will not go through it unless we usually start with metformin for children because the metformin is increasing insulin sensitivity and decrease the glucose output from the liver. The prevention in less than 20 seconds, the prevention is the best prevention in the world regarding not only insulin resistant, insulin resistant and obesity and hypertension and hyperlipidemia, cancer, all the disease in the human is by this. Bismillah. قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما ملأ آدمي وعاء شرا من بطنه بحسب ابن آدم أكلات يقمن صلبا فإن كان لا محالة فثلث لطعامه وثلث لشرابه وثلث لنفسه يخبرنا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أن ملء هذا الوعاء شر على الإنسان ونصح بالاكتفاء من الطعام على قدر الاحتياج Allah. Shukran. Shukran for this very nice presentation and the prevention against type 2 diabetes. Because the, now, the time now, we, are, we should have the break now. So I will allow only two questions, and I hope our speakers will answer in brief. Only two questions. Yes, Dr. Sanjos. to ask about the stem cell uh, uh, you take it the stem cells peripherally for the uh, pancreatic or you uh, you from bone marrow no it's a peripheral blood derived stem cells we uh, mobilize the patients with GCSF for five days so we can increase the percentages of stem cells in the blood and then we take it from the blood and then we put it in that machine that I showed you which is, yeah. called, the, which is called the Clinimax and yeah, and uh, would you, uh, there is a protocol for chemotherapy for that patient? No, or no, 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 no chemotherapy, no myeloblation whatsoever for that patient. These are autologous stem cells. You yeah. don't give the patients chemotherapy for this protocol. Yeah, and uh, when would you expect to see the response? Mm, six to nine months. Uh, after 12 months, we make our final assessment of the, of the results. And you mentioned about T cell programming. Yes. Reprogramming. Yes. It, it takes, like you said, few hours, right? I, uh, can, I can't hear you. Yeah, the T cell programming. Yes. You mentioned that it takes few hours for uh, you. you yes. Yeah. And what did you mean by reprogramming? Reprogramming is uh, where basically T cells or T lymphocytes is basic immunology. So T lymphocytes basically, when they go to the peripheral blood, they're already programmed from the Thymus, that's why we call them T for thymus. So they are already programmed to attack or not attack. So they should know the difference between self and foreign antigens. However, there's a small percentage of T cells that basically lift the thymus and they are armed to attack beta cells in the pancreas. When we reprogram them, we take that very small percentage of, of T cells and we reprogram them not to attack the pancreas. We call it disarmament. Yani this, this arming them. So basically you turn them off and that's what happened. It has been shown in literature for the past 25 years. It's yeah. not a new concept. Yeah, it's not T cell depleted. 
No, no, we don't. We don't have T cells. You don't want the deplete T cells because T cells are very important in fighting disease. We are only turning off autoreactive T cells. That's the point. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Another question, only one question, because we have a coffee break now. Any question? Okay, thank you very much. And we are going uh, to start with Don't Miss Causes of Anemia by Dr. Meha Jasim Borisli. Dr. Meha is a consultant pediatric hematologist in NBK Hospital and uh, for hematology and oncology. She's also the president of uh, Kuwait Thalassemia League as well as Vice President of Kuwaiti Pediatric League. She's uh, actually interest, her ma uh, major interest in leukemia research is hemoglobinopathies. Thank you, Dr. Maha, for being here today and uh, welcome to our uh, conference. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, this session is going to be interactive, so don't um, expect me. Uh, <laughs> You should be part of my talk. So I'm going to be very fast since it, the, the clock is ticking. Can you reverse it or add five minutes? I appreciate it. <laughs> I lost 20 seconds already. So today we're going to talk about anemia. The name is quite large. It's as if you're speaking about one chapter of medicine. So I'm going to touch base on all um, causes of anemia. Uh, because we've seen many, many doctors, uh, they struggle with anemia whenever it presents uh, in the casualty, and they are stopped uh, after they, really, they found out it's not iron deficient anemia. So, let's go. So, which one, right or left? As a definition, the definition, it denotes that the name consists of two words, and, it means without, and him, uh, it means blood. Actually, this uh, lecture is the basic uh, lecture which uh, I give for the uh, chemist candidate who comes to our department. What we mean about the anemia, it's a pathological deficiency uh, for the oxygen carrying component of the blood. And in cases of severe uh, anemia, this can lead even to uh, hypoxia, hypotension, and shock. So it's not something um, you know, easy. Uh, anemia, it's really quite large, but what this is what we mean in comparison normal to anemic blood. So first we'll talk about symptoms and, and signs. Anything in the book, it's, it can cause, I mean, the sign and symptoms, it's so wide. I mean, first we'll talk about symptoms. Um, generally, pa patient will come uh, complaining of fatigue and feeling uh, ill, the appetite will change and when you see the, uh, uh, the constellation of symptom and sign, it can cover to the all, all uh, system of the body. Now, for the causes of anemia, basically it's either it's because of increased loss, increased destruction, or there's a problem with production. So we touch base on each one. First, the anemia related to production. This happens when you have abnormal production or low or no production, uh, for example, aplastic or hyperplastic anemia. Now, for the, uh, uh, the RBC production, abnormal production, this happens either due to malignant causes or benign. The malignant causes is due to anemia. The benign is related either to the abnormal hemoglobin production, as in thalassemia sickle, RBC membrane defects in spherocytosis and elliptocytosis, abnormal enzyme production in G6BD and pyruvate kinase deficiency, and the abnormal shape in sideroblastic uh, anemia. Now, for the increase hemolysis or increased destruction, this can be caused, uh, uh, caused by the either hereditary causes, for example, membrane defect in spherocytosis or due to ab uh, abnormal metabolism in the G6, G6PD or hemoglobin bacteria. For the acquired, it could be due to autoimmune, warm or cold, uh, alloimmunization, a drug infection, chemicals secondary to liver disease, or uh, for, uh, and the uh, last but not least, the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And uh, it could be the, uh, the third cause, it could be due to blood loss. Now, I love this, and Kim's candidate, they know I love this slide. Uh, it's really sometimes difficult to diagnose a child who, who has pallor. Uh, specifically if they have extreme complexion, either very fair or very dark complexion. I always, yeah, and instead of, you know, you know, open the eye looking to the, uh, just look the mouth. It's frank that the child is quite 
pale. This happens also with the fair complexion. The mother noticed that the child becoming increasingly fair. She's not noticing that this is pallor, actually. Now, for the morphology of anemia, this can ha be uh, happening due to either micro microcytic or normal chromic or macrocytic. For the normal chromic, it could be due to anemia for chronic diseases, uh, due to renal uh, failure, endocrine failure, marrow failure, acute blood loss uh, as a cause. Now, when we talk about RBC production, all of you know this happens, uh, 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 the erythroid precursor, the bone marrow, uh, the, we talked a lot about it in the few uh, talks pr uh, previously, but the, the maturation happened over uh, at a, a time and the, the end product is the erythrocyte, which gets to released into, into the uh, circulation before it, it matures into RBC. So the whole life cycle of the RBC is around 120 days. The RBC, it has a unique shape that it allows the, uh, the RBC to move uh, inside the capillary very efficiently and uh, to, uh, be, to deliver the uh, oxygen and also discourage phagocytosis. Uh, this is the normal blood smear, and this, this happens in the bone marrow, and the end, as you can see, the, 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 the uh, down, you can see down there, it's the products that you're gonna see in the blood. All other components you're not supposed to, see, to be seen in the blood. Whenever you see them, you suspect something, uh, you know, not uh, nice happening in the blood. Now, this is what happens in the general circulation. The RBC gets to be uh, produced, uh, it goes to the circulation, stay 120 days, and then it will be, uh, their life it will be ended by phagocytosis, and then some of the component will be reabsorbed and used, and some of them it will be uh, released uh, and uh, get secreted from the body. And uh, it's important to know that uh, many organs play a vital role in production of RBC, for example, the role of erythropoietin. Uh, the, uh, at the top left, you can see the progenitor of the erythrocyte, and then the last, uh, uh, you can see the, 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 as the cell differentiate, the shape changes, and even the size, and there is a big difference between the normal plus and the mature RBCs. Important to know the site of blood production in the, uh, in, the, in the child, as the child grows, it's different. For example, in the fetus, it get been, it, the blood's being produced by many uh, areas of the body. For example, in the first uh, month of pre-gestation, different than, than the last month of gestation, when being taken over basically by the uh, bone marrow. But when the child gets to be born, all the uh, bone marrow will produce uh, blood. But, but as the child grow up, this will be restricted to some areas, not the all, all bones will produce uh, uh, you know, RBCs. The, the, um, this is the hemoglobin, and which has the, uh, the heme and globin part for the normal hemoglobin. And this is very important slides. This slides tell you about the production of the uh, hemoglobin. Uh, we have the globin chain, we have the alpha and beta. And as you can see, the alpha get be, to be produced early in intrauterine all through life. But the, but the gamma, which is, infant, which is part of the infant type blood, it's produced during the infant, uh, the child pregestation uh, in the uh, mother womb. You can see the gamma. And then it gets to increase uh, by the six month to be, uh, to be replaced by the beta chain. This slide is important to, to tell you when, uh, when you take any investigation for ch the child, what to expect. So this is the normal. So if you take a blood uh, sample and do HBLC for a child who is at birth, you are expecting to see he's having infantile uh, um, uh, hemoglobin in comparison to when you take it uh, more than one, one, one year onwards, you will see disappearance of the infantile and then re be re replaced by the adult hemoglobin. And it's important to know that the, the blood uh, changes uh, through the life. Hemoglobin to get uh, to be um, different percentage through life. So when you see a child uh, at the first month of life with a low hemoglobin, don't get, don't get panicky. Uh, this, will, uh, this is just a physiolo physiological anemia it, and it will be corrected as the child grows up. So it's important to know for each different age, there is uh, um, uh, what, uh, the average for hemoglobin. 
and it's a balance. Whenever you have the alpha beta uh, chain, um, the scale get uh, to be disturbed, you'll you're either gonna, if you have too much of alpha or, 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 or uh, less of alpha, you're gonna have alpha thalassemia. If you have also less of beta, you're gonna have beta thalassemia. Uh, now, this is the first scenario. Please uh, help me. Uh, this child uh, is six months old, and the child, the mother noticed that the child is becoming, at six months, very irritable. He, his appetite decreased, and she, the mother, the neighbor told her that he looked pale. He looked, uh, the color is not really normal. Her brother-in-law has children with a blood problem, but she doesn't, she's not sure what kind of blood problem. But on examination, the child is quite, uh, he's very quiet in the mother lab, and there is a thin jaundice, and the liver and spleen are felt. His hemoglobin around 50. So what do you think this? Answers? That's, I told you it's interactive, so I need the answer. Must matter. Yeah. No, I need suggestion. I'm, I'm just giving you. It is? Okay, I, since I don't hear you, then I'm gonna answer. It, yeah, but uh, what I'm telling, I'm giving you clues. So the clue in this history, I, I'm giving you the history. In the clue, uh, a family history, cousins. So you would expect what? Thalassemia. Uh, I'm just, uh, it's a message, just look into the history. So thalassemia is, is one of the causes of uh, hereditary anemia, where you have pa both parents are a uh, carrier uh, of, uh, of, uh, the, uh, of the thalassemia, and then we're gonna have one, at least one in four statistically to have uh, a thalassemia patient. And the thalassemia, they, they have this very small RBC that doesn't live for a very long time, and they end up having uh, to be treated with a regular blood transfusion. And they all have this feature because the bone marrow grows in their body and they have specific feature. And because they have a, a lot of uh, uh, RBC, uh, they got to be fractured and into the circulation, they have uh, plenty of iron and then get to deposited into the whole body and they will have a lot of iron overload. So now for the scenario, the second scenario, please look to the clues. I have somebody who should answer. <laughs> Three year old, at, um, and the, at the, they went to a holiday, and they went came, when they came back from the other country, the child was in severe pain, crying, and, and somebody has to answer here. And uh, there's no history of trauma, and the mother recall many incidents uh, as such.